trying the Hadza the Hunter Gatherer Berry and Porcupine Diet. The Hadza are one of the last remaining hunter gatherer tribes in the world. It's thought they've lived on the same land in northern Tanzania eating berries. Tubers and 30 different mammals for 40,000 years. The BBC's Dan Saladino went to watch them foraging and hunting and to ask whether their diet holds lessons for everyone. Warning, some readers will find images of hunted animals disturbing. As I lay flat on my stomach, I put my head inside the dark tunnel and sniffed. Animal. But I couldn't believe someone was actually going to slide inside and flush the animal out. That someone was Zigwoodsy, and the animal, well, that was a porcupine. After handing his bow and arrow and honey axe to a fellow Hadza hunter, Zigwitzy stripped off, took hold of a short, sharpened stick and disappeared down the hole. Perhaps I thought he was the smallest of the group and so the obvious choice. But the more I watched, the more I realized it was because Zigwitzy was the one with the least fear of what might lurk there, the cobra and mamba snakes, the reptiles, fleas and ticks and the porcupine with its bristling 35 centimeters 14 inches quills. Up to this point, my Hadza diet had been strictly vegetarian as it is much of the time for these people. Handfuls of berries picked from bushes as we wandered the dry woodland savanna over thorns, past acacia trees and through parched grass. There had been the occasional crunchy moist tuber dug up from just below ground and cooked on a quickly conjured fire. There were also lots and lots of baobab fruit. The baobab trees rattling pods of fatty beans, packed with a white, zesty chalk-like dust, are made into a drink of pure fiber and vitamin C. Anthropologists noted decades ago that the Hadza are always hungry but never starving. Their enthusiasm for eating is matched by an abundance of ingredients around them, and the tracking and foraging skills needed to find them. All around us were foodstuffs I couldn't spot but that Hadza children even those as young as four are adept at finding. Soon all I could hear of Zigwitzy was a distant, muffled voice. He was two meters, six feet underground inside a hot network of tunnels and chambers where a porcupine was hiding. As he mapped out the animal subterranean world, he shouted instructions to his fellow hunters above ground to close off any escape routes. After 40 minutes, he re-emerged, covered in dust and a few fleas, ready to dig down further at the exact spot where the porcupine was located. Hadza men gathering honey. Although the Hadza number around 1,000 men, women and children, there are now thought to be only 200 to 300 pure hunter-gatherers who grow no food and practice no form of agriculture. These Hadza find farmers a curious and amusing lot. One asked me, why stand in a field all day and wait for weeks or months for food when you can eat berries from a bush? Find as much honey as you can eat or spend an hour inside a porcupine den and feed an entire camp. This is how our ancient ancestors sourced their food and nourished themselves. The meals Zigwitzy and his fellow heads eat are our last remaining link to the diets on which humans evolved and through which our digestive system developed, including the complex community of gut bacteria we all have, weighing 1 to 2 kilograms in an adult, the so-called microbiome. There is now a growing consensus in the medical world that our gut microbiomes play a major role in the operation of our immune system and that the more rich and diverse our microbiomes are, the lower our risk of disease. And it so happens that the Hadza, because of their diet, have the most diverse human gut microbiomes on the planet.
Among my traveling companions was Tim Spector, professor of genetic epidemiology at King's College London, who was keen to find out whether, if he ate like a hadza, his own microbiome would become more like theirs. So he took samples of his own feces before and after three days on a hadza diet. In order to check whether the variety of different bacteria present changed, the results were impressive. After just three days, the diversity of bacteria in his already healthy microbiome had increased by 20%, and he was able to detect rare forms of bacteria often associated with good health. It may take years for Spectre's research to reach a definite conclusion about our own optimum diets. But there is a sense of urgency, because things are changing for the Hadza and fast. For me, though, the biggest surprise was an incursion of a different kind. A 30-minute drive from the porcupine hunt was a mud hut at a crossroads of tracks and inside. Shelves filled with cans of sugary soft drinks and packets of biscuits. It had taken me nine hours by Land Rover over tough terrain to get here, only to find the biggest brands in the world had made it before me. Zigwitzy, however, was keeping the flame of Hadza wisdom alive, which would mean a swift and efficient end for the porcupine. Face to face with the animal, Zigwitzy nudged it with a stick and called to it, Come out porcupine, come to me, come here porcupine, then, not one but two crested porcupine emerged. The most striking thing wasn't the long black and white quills on their lumbering bodies which at 30 kilograms each were bigger than you might think it was the noise. A wall of sound, of quills rattled in warning. It filled the air and intensified as Zigwitzy delivered a few hard blows to the porcupine's heads. And then it was all over. Ads the hunters share everything, there's as an egalitarian society. They have no leadership structures and with meat especially, there's an obligation to divide what is caught equally. The offal, the heart, liver and lungs were cooked on this spot and eaten immediately, the butchered carcasses taken back to the camps and distributed. As I watched and nervously nibbled on a piece of porcupine liver, I realized I'd watched something special. A hunt and a meal that had allowed me a connection to the ancient past.